Hi, Oddings. Welcome to Stories with Sapphire. I'm your Ate Sapphire. I have a lot of exciting projects coming up, but unfortunately, that means the show will be going on hiatus and returning in October. To get your spooky story fix in the meantime, check out my friend Josh's channel, Haunting Season. Here he is with an original scary story that I know you'll love. And now... It's story time. Marcus had one goal in life, to create a piece of art that was too terrifying to look at. An image so frightening, so unsettling, that people had no choice but to avert their eyes. He fed the call of his creativity every night when it was most hungry. Around midnight when inspiration hit, he pulled out his pencils and started to form shapes on his sketch pad. Occasionally these sessions of passion lasted until dawn, but more often than not, they petered out after an hour and the results were always the same. Underwhelming. That was before he received the gift. By the light of day, Marcus was a postal worker here in Salem, which was more work than most would assume. 9 a.m. roundup for team meetings, 9.15 hit the sorting room to organize the deliveries for the day, and then it was out to drive, park, organize, and deliver. Drive, park, organize, and deliver. Drive, park. It wasn't particularly difficult work, but it was draining. On average, Marcus could clock about six miles of walking and lifting in a day, and because of this and a decent metabolism, he never had to worry much about diet and exercise. He was a lean, mean, mail delivery machine with a proclivity for the dark and the wicked. Where the idea came from, he was unsure, but it started to form while living with his father in Brooklyn. See, Pops had taken every drug on the planet and they ate him from the inside out. Marcus raised himself from the depths of deep Brooklyn and as his father rotted away, lips curling back, hair like withered straw, eyes perpetually bloody, deep sores breaking into itchy black infections, Marcus escaped. There were few creative spaces in Brownsville, but Bushwick was a short bike ride away and the public library there provided the space and peace to study, to learn, and to craft. Drawing had started as a way to avoid going home after classwork was finished, but it quickly became a necessity. Putting pencil to paper like this was like opening his veins and letting the sick pour out. The images were dark from the beginning, starting with zombies, teeth showing through cheekbones, brains slightly exposed, eyeballs falling out. They were cartoon illustrations, comical, fun. But as the months rolled on, his wrist and fingers found more nuanced flicks and twists. Marcus began to notice light and how it hit people's faces from the desk lamps in the windowless section of the library. Hard, dramatic, with deep shadows. His new vision influenced his sketches, becoming more realistic, more gruesome. There came a point in his senior year of high school where Marcus outgrew the resources of the library. He had thumbed through every page of the occult section, looked at every dark painting in the art books, and still felt there was something untapped. It made him feel good that his drawings were unsettling some of the young moms at the library, but instead of avoiding that portion of the book stacks, they started to make scenes, jerking their children away and shrieking. When the librarian ran over, they apologized erroneously. I'm sorry, I'm really so sorry for shouting. I've just never been so disturbed in my life. There are children in this library, sir. You should be ashamed of yourself. And you, how could you allow such disgusting things to happen in your place of work? The library is a place for children, not witches and Satanists. The librarian was a pushover to whomever was making the most noise, and these young mommies certainly made noise. An army formed of little soldiers, one by one causing a scene until the librarian was forced to make a judgment call. The neighborhood was changing. and was now full of nice families who didn't want some weirdo guy scaring their children. 
On Marcus's last day in Bushwick, the Mommy Army brought some of their men to make sure the message stuck. They mutilated his bike beyond repair and left his body full of bruises. It was a long walk home. The next few months were hard. The apartment was nothing more than a nest for his rat father. Teeth rotted sharp, face peeling, breath wheezing. Even with the windows open, it smelled of chemicals, bile, and mold. The constant flow of users coming to buy a quick fix were endless inspiration for Marcus, and now that he knew what to do with them, he didn't mind it so much. He only got glimpses from his bedroom door, but the rot sat like trauma in his mind, and without the time to sit and stare at a subject, as he did in the library, more was left to the imagination. His drawings were evolving into the abstract, heads held up by wisps of hair, hands connected by chains to loose shirt sleeves, faces filled with spiked rows of teeth and round glowing eyes all drawn to the sounds of pops arguing with the lamp or the toaster about things Marcus would never see for fear of rotting alive himself. Despite his hardships, Marcus graduated high school that spring. He walked alone from his parentless graduation and arrived home to find that he was now on his own. Pops had found Marcus's drawings during what could only be assumed to be a bad trip and hanged himself with the shower curtain after gouging out his eyeballs with dirty spoons crusted with Chinese food. He hung, knees an inch from the ground, like a blue swollen jack-o'-lantern atop a scarecrow with no stuffing, clothes hanging loose on his skeletal, drug-worn body. Marcus wasn't surprised, just disturbed and disappointed. Drugs and demons aside, Pops deserved better. Marcus untwirled the mold and rust-stained curtain from his father's neck and did his best to lower the body gracefully to the floor. Pops' shell was small, but surprisingly heavy. Grabbing under the armpits, Marcus leaned back heavily and dragged the body into the hallway. He tried to look anywhere but down. However, the moment he finally gave in to the temptation, he was transfixed. Once glazed with a euphoric haze, the eyes of his father were nothing more than fleshy pits and tendrils, a sight far more impactful in person than with graphite. He allowed his eyes to explore the tragedy for a few moments before placing his father's right arm across the empty pits, perhaps to protect them from the rats and the roaches, and sauntered into his bedroom to make a plan. Marcus didn't cry. He just sat on his bed staring at the door. A few feet away, amidst the mess of dark art strewn across the desk, was a shoebox full of cash and a note with two words on it. Free yourself. $75,000 in cash was enough to disappear. Marcus bought a used car, moved to Salem into a modest studio apartment, and got his job at the post office. He thought about going to art school, but couldn't see a future where spending 75 k that quickly would pay off. So he kept at it, using the new environment, the witchy history, and the secrets of his past as fuel to keep working towards the ultimate goal of unviewable art. Things had been uneventful until this afternoon, when Marcus unlocked the last blue postal box of the day to reveal a package wrapped in black paper with no visible markings on it. Unsure of what to do, he placed it on the floor of the mail truck near the front seat and retrieved it after his final hour of sorting. The package was almost invisible, sitting on the dark wood of the dining table, but it was unmistakably present. There was an energy about it, an almost imperceptible vibration that Marcus felt the moment he saw it, as if the package was beckoning him to see what lay inside. Opening someone else's mail is a federal offense, but this didn't appear to be mail. From whom was anyone's guess, but there was no doubt it was a gift intended for the postal worker who frequented the box. A brief thought of explosives crossed his mind, but aside from the mean mommies in Brooklyn almost two years ago, Marcus never met anybody he didn't get along with. People love getting the mail, and being a postal worker meant people loved him too. 
Flipping open his pocket knife, he loosed the paper, careful not to tear it, and with his heart pumping, sweat forming on his upper lip, he turned it inside out to see a message written for him. A triangle with three foreign-looking words, one written on each corner, and in the middle, in beautiful cursive handwriting, free yourself. Impossible. Pops was dead. The message he left seen only by Marcus that night before calling the police. And who? His lip began to quiver. The images of Pops from that night had been buried deep, but they were clawing through the soil of his mind now, hungry for his brain. Pushing the wrapping aside, Marcus fumbled for the box and pulled out a thick black candle. What is this? He thought. Some sort of late funeral gift? The tears began to flow freely, mixing with his sweat as he held the candle in his lap. When did it get so hot in here? He ran his fingers along the candle's body, searching for any more clues that he could find. The salty water from his eyes pounded down on the wax, and a word inscribed on the side lit up with a soft glow. Lacrime. Marcus wiped his face with the palm of his hand, unsure of what he was seeing, but before he could think too much, his hand lit up another word upon contact. Sudor. He looked at the triangle on the paper. The last word. Sanguis. What did this mean? Pulling the wrapping to the center of the table, Marcus clunked down the candle in the middle of the triangle and scrambled to the junk drawer to find the matches. Fire, of course. A candle needs a flame. They've got to be in here somewhere. He ripped the drawer from the cabinet and dumped the chattel with a cacophony of hard, small things hitting the countertop, pushing aside beer bottle caps and rubber bands, dollar store screwdrivers and Ikea hex keys, until he finally found the battered box of the matches he took from the Mexican place the night he rolled into town. Marcus slid the box open to reveal two small wooden matches took a deep breath in. Still sweating, the room felt like an inferno. What would happen when he lit the candle? Why was he scared? He took his time, sitting back in his seat, and made sure to light the first match properly, without breaking it, and rested the flame in the top of the candle. Nothing. He held it there until it burnt his finger, but the wick didn't light. What kind of candle doesn't light? Marcus reached for the second match and struck it in the same way, holding the flame against the wick, but to no avail. The room was throbbing like a headache. The candle wanted something, but what? Marcus tried to make sense of it. The first word lit up from his tears, and the second, his sweat. Sweat. Tears. Truth dawned on him as he reached for his fine tip pencil and the sharpener, twisting the wood and graphite to a needlepoint. Marcus placed the blunt end against the table, held fast by his left fist, and pushed his right palm until the skin punctured and the blood spilled out. And then he reached for the candle. On contact, a tall flame burst from the wax like a cheap firecracker. The room was lit with darkness and Marcus's eyes rolled back into his skull as he began to draw. His hand jerked violently as if taken by something else. Psychedelic visions kaleidoscoped endlessly through his consciousness as his body was used to create the monstrosity. In the morning, Marcus woke with a purulent quarter stigmata in a messy kitchen. The candle, despite being quite large last night, had burnt to the bottom, leaving black hard wax over half the dining table. But none of that mattered, because before him was his drawing, face down with just a hint of a shape showing through the back of the paper. Marcus knew he couldn't look at it, but he had to know. Was this the one? After some deliberation, he decided to pack it in his satchel and bring it to work. It didn't seem safe to leave the drawing alone. On the way in, he saw a veteran on the street corner asking for money. Marcus offered him $20 cash if he'd look at the drawing. The man took one petrified look 
pushed both his fists into his eyes and walked into traffic where a semi painted the road red with him like a wet brush. Marcus got lost in the remaining blocks to work and ended up at a park, staring into nothingness, hands shaking, watery eyes. That blood was on his hands. He had unleashed the most wicked of images, and there was no telling what pain it would bring. The sun rose and fell by the time cool moonlight shivered up his spine. Marcus had balanced himself, letting the accident, and he was sure it was an accident, drift away into a frozen block of memory and helpful reasoning. The man was most likely mentally unstable. He was too weak to see the image. But what would happen to someone of sound mind? Someone like an art critic? After waiting for the Abstractia Gallery to open, Marcus talked the owner into taking a look. He warned the man of his goal and how he believed he had achieved it. This was Salem, after all, so how could the man resist? The critic asked if he could take it upstairs to review privately. He returned promptly, via the sidewalk. His face flattened as bits of skull and gray matter stippled the ankles of pedestrians. The drawing floated down slowly from the second story window. Marcus could feel it pulsating from where he stood inside. It wanted more. And it was quickly picked up by a woman who had run to the scene of the suicide. She smashed her head through the plate glass window, grasping at the shards and shoving them into her eyes until her body stopped. Marcus could see the picture, drawing side up on the pavement, tempting another meal. It had to be sheathed before anything else could happen. Moving sideways, Marcus used his peripheral vision to navigate to the paper, retrieved it with his eyes closed, and ran home. Marcus tried ripping, tried flushing, tried laying the paper across four lit stovetop burners, but nothing could destroy the evil he had unleashed. He thought about burying it, about sealing it in the walls of the house, but he knew he'd hear it calling if it wasn't put to use. Distraught, he shoved it back in his satchel next to his book on loan and paused, closing his eyes as a dark splinter of a smile cracked across his lips. He knew what he had to do. Marcus grabbed his keys. They called it the Mass Mommy Suicide, and legend has it that behind a particular shelf of occult books lies a sealed off wing where the women used to meet to talk about improving the neighborhood. The image still hangs over the blood-stained basement floor of the Bushwick branch of the Brooklyn Public Library, threatening to take all who enter there. If you don't want nightmares tonight, subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Submit your own stories to storieswithsapphire at gmail.com. For more spooky, supernatural, and spiritual stories, listen to the Stories with Sapphire podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you saw and would like to support this independently run show, head over to patreon.com slash storieswithsapphire. Until we meet again, sleep tight.